For those of you who haven't met, I am your friendly neighborhood District 1 City Councilman, Diego Bernal. Thank you so much for coming to our public bu budget meeting and discussion. Uh, this is our, it's my third one, and you know, I'll, I'll admit that when I ran for office the first time, I was a very anti-establishment guy. Um, but I, I assure you that I have seen the discussion that we've had in settings like this become policy. I've seen money move from one place to another. I've seen priorities change based on these discussions and your input. And they really do make a difference and they provide really, really good guidance for us to figure out what to do with the resources that we have. Uh, I'd ask that you uh, be very candid, that you be very honest, that you ask all the questions you need to ask, uh, and you've got a tremendous amount of support and staff here to answer your questions uh, and to even settle some debates, to demystify certain things, but this is a very important exercise for us, and I take it very seriously. I know the staff takes it very seriously. So. Uh, thank you so much for coming. It means a great deal to us. We're also happy that you may have noticed that the original plan was to do it in four sectors of the city. And as the guy who's responsible for the core, I wanted to make sure that, that we got our shot. And so it's nice to see so many of you here. Uh, I'm going to pass the microphone to our city manager, Cheryl Scully, and then we'll watch the video. But thank you guys so much. And I'll be around for the entire thing. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Councilman. Okay, good evening. I'm glad to be here with you. This is our fifth meeting this week, and it's our final meeting this week to gather input before we prepare the budget. We'll use the information and the input we receive at our goal setting session with the City Council next Tuesday. They have an all day work session to talk about budget priorities, and we share with them the information that we receive from these meetings. So, as the Councilman said, your input is very valuable. This is my favorite district. Don't tell the other districts that. Uh, but I live in this district too, so I'm, I'm glad to be here with all of you this evening. And I see a number of people who have come regularly over the years, so we appreciate your continued support and input and some new faces too, so that's great. Thank you for being here. So the way the program works tonight, we're going to show you a video that just highlights uh, in a summary way the overall city budget, what the components are, income as well as expense, and then we'll have some instructions about what we want you to do at your tables to give us some input on areas where we can make reductions and areas where you would like to see more emphasis within the budget. So let's take a look at the video first, and uh, then we will say a few things about our, our program this evening. And let me also just introduce the staff who are here. So if you're a staff member sitting at a table, and we have facilitators to help take notes at each of the tables that are staff members. And we also have a number of other city staff members from budget, as well as executives here tonight. I see both of our chiefs here as well, uh, Chief McManus, Police Chief, and Chief Hood, Fire Chief. Uh, in the back of the room. So they're here tonight too, and we're all here as resources. So we'll kind of move around, and if you have questions, you want to ask us something about the budget, we're happy to talk with you about it as well. So city staff, would you just stand up and so that everyone knows who you are? And if they have questions, you can pull one of us aside. And those budget staff in the back of the room, wave to Maria Villa Gomez. Uh, is right there, our outstanding budget director. So we're here as a resource to you to answer questions that you have. Let's roll the video, then we'll have a few things to say about the budget, and then, uh, then we'll take some questions and answers, okay? Uh-huh. Yes. Yep, 450 square miles. Uh huh. Good. Well, we have them scattered throughout the city. Yeah. Well, that's why Councilman Bernal has the meeting here tonight. Yes. Good. Well, we're glad you're here, but somehow you got to three this week, so we appreciate that as well. Thank you. Okay. Well, we do five before. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, and you're going to go to the city council already, and you didn't even hear within 
Yeah, well, this is proposed budget. So what we do, we take this input and uh, we present that to the city council. We'll present the budget. We work on the development of the budget all summer and with the input we get from the council members on Tuesday at the goal setting session. I'll present the, a balanced budget to the city council on August 7th. Then we'll go out and do another series of meetings throughout the community, another five of these meetings throughout the city, and then the council will consider adoption of the budget on September 11th. So we have several more months of budget development and conversation with the community, and we thank you for being here tonight. Let's roll the video, and then we have a few other instructions before we get started. The many services provided by the City of San Antonio are prioritized and funded through the adopted annual budget. This video will provide you with an overview of the many services provided by the City and explain how the City pays for these services. With an annual budget of $2.3 billion and 11,300 employees, the City of San Antonio strives to provide you with high quality services every day. So how does the city's budget work? The city's total budget is divided into separate funds, including the general fund, restricted funds, and the capital budget. The largest of these funds is the city's general fund, which receives funding from four major sources of revenue. Property taxes, sales taxes, CPS energy revenues, and other revenues. Property taxes represent the city's portion of the taxes you pay on your home and business. However, the city's portion of your total property tax bill is only about 25%. Sales taxes are collected on purchases made throughout the city and are dependent on the local economy. CPS Energy provides a portion of its gross profits to the city as a return on investment, and these revenues vary based on the South Texas weather. Finally, other revenues represent funding collected from user fees, licenses, and permits. Together, these revenues support the majority of city services. Two-thirds of the total general fund budget is allocated to the police and fire departments. With more than 4,000 uniformed personnel, the police and fire departments enforce the law, protect San Antonio residents, their families, and their homes. The remaining one-third of the general fund resources support critical city services such as streets, parks, libraries, code enforcement, health and human services, and animal care. The City of San Antonio is facing a financial challenge of $27 to $34 million in fiscal year 2015 in the general fund. Expenditures in the general fund are growing at a faster pace than general fund revenues. The financial challenges that the city faces in 2015 include the increased cost of providing health care benefits to uniform police and fire employees, maintaining a AAA bond rating, maintaining a balance between public safety and other services paid by the general fund, and the many needs across the city, including street maintenance, new sidewalks, library services, human services, and the maintenance of city facilities. In order to maintain a balanced budget in fiscal year 2015, as required by law, the city will have to prioritize services and redirect resources in the general fund. More than 66% of the general fund is allocated to the police and fire budgets. If the community desires to maintain or increase the funds allocated to police and fire, other city services such as streets, parks, libraries, animal care, code enforcement, and health and human services would have to be reduced. The city maintains more than 4,000 miles of streets, more than 400 miles of drainage infrastructure, and more than 1,300 traffic signals. The maintenance and preservation of the city's streets and sidewalks 
is the responsibility of the city's Transportation and Capital Improvements Department. Each day, city employees work to preserve and maintain streets across San Antonio by filling in potholes, as well as maintaining city drainage channels, adding bike lanes, and building new sidewalks. The Parks and Recreation Department maintains 244 parks, 14,816 acres of parkland, 145 miles of trails, 24 outdoor pools, and 29 community centers throughout the city. San Antonio's 26 libraries provide residents of all ages access to books, computers, and educational programs. Through the libraries, you can receive live homework assistance and download ebooks, audiobooks, music, and videos for free. The Animal Care Services Department is committed to improving outcomes for San Antonio's pet population through increased education, adoptions, and enforcement. For the current fiscal year, resources were added to increase spay neuter surgeries enhance licensing awareness, and reduce the number of loose and stray animals. As a result of these additional resources and many other efforts by the Animal Care Services Department, the city has been able to increase its live pet release rate from 30% in 2011 to 80% today. The city provides code enforcement officers who work throughout San Antonio to maintain the safety and integrity of our neighborhoods. These officers enforce the city's property maintenance code, address concerns caused by unoccupied and dilapidated structures, and help prevent and abate graffiti. Other important city services are funded by restricted funds that are not supported by property tax revenue. The rates and fees that support services paid by restricted funds cannot be used to pay for services in the general fund, such as police, fire, streets, or code enforcement. Services paid by restricted funds include garbage collection, review of new commercial and residential development permits, operations of the international airport, and the city's parking operations. Ensuring that the fiscal year 2015 budget is financially balanced and reflects the priorities of the community is a collaborative effort between residents, city leaders, and city staff. The city wants to know which services matter most to you. Let us know your priorities by attending one of five community budget input hearings scheduled from May 19th to May 22nd. You can also provide your input through the City's Budget Input Box, located inside libraries, senior centers, and online at www.sanantonio.gov slash budget. With your assistance, the City of San Antonio can continue to deliver high-quality services to all residents in our great community. Okay, so by law, the city of San Antonio is required to maintain a balanced budget. So when we talk about a budget challenge going into the next fiscal year, what we mean is that based on today's level of service, if we were to do everything we're doing today in the next fiscal year, and based upon the estimated revenue that we're projecting for the upcoming fiscal year, we have a budget challenge of 27 to 34 million. So that means that when I present the budget, because I'm required by law to present a balanced budget, that I'll submit to council some reductions as well as perhaps some revenue enhancements. How do we manage the resources that we have available and maintain the quality service that we want? Over the past eight years, we've added nearly 500 police officers and firefighters. We've reduced our civilian employment through attrition, not with layoffs, but through attrition by nearly 1,200 positions. So today, as compared to eight years ago, we are doing more with fewer employees than we had eight years ago. 
And yet, think about that. We have more fire stations, more libraries, hundreds of additional parkland. So we're doing it by changing our business process and how we deliver that service to the community. And it reflects the priorities of you, that you give us input, the mayor and city council tell us what they would like to see included in the budget. We make the very best presentation that we can incorporating those priorities. And that of the entire community also taking into account SA 2020. We started off in this room and I see Daryl Birds here tonight, the director of SA 2020. In the community, hundreds of people participated in the process, giving input as to what's important. We appreciate the work of all of our city employees and we are grateful for the work of our public safety personnel. But you've probably heard a lot about and maybe read a little bit in the media about some of the conversation we're having. What are fair and equitable as well as affordable to the taxpayer compensation and benefits for all of our city employees. We want to be competitive, but it also has to be affordable to the taxpayers. And that's what we're trying to achieve, making adjustments because we all pay for health care and we need to make changes to ensure that we can continue to fund the number of personnel that we need for our city. We're one of the fastest growing cities in the country and we know that we'll need some additional services for the growing population. We're now exceeding 1.4 million. And to do that, we have to make sure that what we're doing is in the best financial way for you, bringing greatest value for the dollar paid, the tax dollars that we receive. So tonight, and Maria, where's Maria, our budget director? She's going to go over the little charts on the table and tell you a little bit more about the process will take about a half hour to get your conversation and then we'll have a report out at the end of the evening for you to designate someone at each of your tables. Now, one other thing I'd like to ask you to do, since there's a staffer at each table to take notes uh, for you, you might start by having everyone introduce themselves to ensure that those who are here for the first time have a chance to contribute and give their input. How many of you have been to another one of our meetings this week? So almost half of you have come. Well, just we have a lot of neighborhood association and social service and uh, public safety representatives and other associations here. So just have everyone at your table identify themselves and if they're representing a group, um, let because then you'll understand the context of perhaps their input this evening as well. So let me introduce Maria Via Gomez and she'll give you some instructions about the sheet and then we'll get started. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good evening. And um, now that you learned a little bit about the budget process and some of the financial challenges that we're facing for next year, it's time for us to ask for your input so we can balance the budget for next year. So we have an exercise at your table. We're going to ask you three questions with the facilitator that you have at your table. So the first question is to provide us with some areas that you would be willing to reduce in order to balance the budget. So as you heard on the video, we're facing a 27 to $34 million deficit for next year. So in order to balance the budget, the options that we have is to reduce cost or increase revenues. So we're asking you for about five areas that you would be willing to reduce either programs or services within the general fund that will give us some uh, direction as we prepare the proposed budget. The second question is, are you willing to increase some of the revenues within the general fund? So for example, property taxes uh, is about 25% of the general fund revenues that we receive. So for every dollar that you pay for your residence or your business, the city gets about 25 cents for every dollar that you pay on property taxes. The city has not increased the city property tax rate for about 20 years. So if the community is willing to increase property taxes, let's say one cent, that generates about $7.4 million annually. The impact to the average homeowner based on the average homestead of $134,000 
is $14 a year. That would be the impact, again, to the average homeowner. So if you're willing to increase revenue, such as property tax, then um, that will be something to, uh, to consider. Uh, other revenues within the general fund includes like our EMS transport fees, our alarm fees, uh, parks fees, and some other user fees. So give us some ideas if you are willing um, or would like for us to consider increasing revenues. Then the third question of the exercise is if there are some areas within the general fund budget that you would like to increase uh, or perhaps a new program, please provide us with those ideas. Since we mentioned that we are facing a financial deficit, we would have to reprioritize within the general fund. So as you come up with ideas on how to increase some of the new programs, then also give us an idea where do we get that money from, perhaps from another program that the community may think this is no longer a priority for us, please reduce this and reprioritize the funding to another service. So that's what we're doing tonight. We have 30 minutes. There's a facilitator at each of your tables to help you answer any questions, and I'll be walking around also to assist with any questions that you may have. Thank you. How many times Because you said you didn't raise it in the last time. Uh, Mr. Black here at table two had a question on how many times we have decreased the property tax rate over the past 10 years, and that is three times. Thank you. Hi, how's it going? Uh, Diego Bernal, I'm the city councilman for District 1. Can you tell me what just happened here? Uh, well, we just had our budget priorities meeting where we invite the public to tell us what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, and the ways that they'd like us to either see, see us spend or cut money in the budget so we have a good year after that. Where does all this information go after it's been collected? Well, I think that it goes two places. First of all, it's good for me to hear it because at the end of the day, my colleagues and I have to make the decision, so it's, it's very valuable to, to me not just to get a report or a, a bunch of dots on a piece of paper, but to have heard people talk about it and explain what their priorities are. And then uh, the staff will sort of collect all the comments and put them together and say, well, here are all the things that were talked about, here are the things that were mentioned over and over again, here are the things that were mentioned once or twice, and that way we can kind of try to put the data from all the meetings together and figure out if we can if there's a, a sense that we can get from a city perspective. Or say, well, look, on this part of town, the priority was this, but if you go over here, they were talking about different things, and that will help us figure out how to spend money in either place. Did, that, did I explain that okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so is this the first time you've done this? No, this is the third time I've done it. Do you enjoy it? I do. I mean, sometimes it gets a little bit tense, but, but that's okay, because you know my job is to listen and then take those comments and do something with them. Um, I learned early on that if I think I know best, I, I usually get it wrong because there's so, there's so many people in the room, there's so many, there's a diversity of thought that um, really listening to what people have to say and allowing them to talk about the main piece and the nuances, uh, you walk away with a really good sense about how they're feeling and what they want to see and what they want of you, or me in this case. So if somebody wasn't able to attend this, what could they do to get their input in? Well, they can always uh, they can always contact the office. They can always call us or email us. They can Facebook me. They can Twitter. I don't know how they would Instagram, but I guess there's a way to do it. Uh, and then, you know, there's there's some exercises online or there's some materials online that they can access also and get that to us. I mean, there's a lot of ways to let us know. Uh, and also, sometimes I like the exercise. I think it's important. But sometimes people just want to have a conversation about the budget. They want to have a conversation about what's important to them. And so, again, all those online means, social media. I do coffee with the councilman every other week, practically, at a eatery or a cafe around the district. They can come to one of those and talk to me. Uh, they can come to office hours. I have late office hours from 5 to 9 p.m. On, on, on Mondays. So there's a lots of other ways. So I like the exercise, but it's certainly not the only way they can do this.
I think that's it. Thank Is that you. it? Good. All right. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Because we're going to go by table and have you guys present your recommendations. Uh, we're trying to, there's a lot of tables, so we're going to try to get through it. Here's what I need. I'm going to need a table to go first, and when they start, then we're all going to have to wind it down so we can hear them, all right? All right, let's start with table number two. All right, we're starting, you guys. can't look at it and talk to people that are this way. So could we just go back up this way a little bit? Um, hi, we had a lot of um, heated discussion, but I don't want to say that we have consensus because I don't think we, we do uh, on most items, but I think there's, we have a lot of questions. Um, one of the clear ones that people did seem to agree to would be to have some sort of a property tax increase um, as a revenue source. Um, other things that we'd like to look into are, um, one, executive pay, um, to see if there can't be trims, trimmings made there. Uh, there's three categories that were listed on the budget that um, add up to about $61 million, but we're not even, you know, there's just like one little paper with a lot of little print on it that may be able to get some savings out of that area. And that's one that's called um, the, re okay, I better use my own list. Uh, one is non-departmental, and that's 39 million. Agencies, 18 million, 651,000. And transfers, 9 million, 454,000. So that's, that's a lot of money, $61 million. And we'd just like to have some group maybe, citizens group included, uh, to look into that. And then... There is definitely, you know, we've kind of been primed to look at the police and, and fire things, but there's also the other issue, uh, the police and fire costs, but there's the other issue of the city employees that have been getting a lot of cuts, and there are 11,000 of them that see their salaries cut, and they don't have the negotiating rights that police and fire do. So we're not saying these have to be cut and these have to be increased, but we definitely need to look into both so that we have um, people getting equitable salaries. All right. All right, thank you guys very much. I've heard the presenter for table four has to leave, so I thought we'd go to table four to make sure that they can get in. Testing out. Okay, what we figured here uh, under the budget gap for 2734 really couldn't come out to a, an amount, but we do figure under the economic development is to reduce the amount of the abatements under corporate uh, industry and companies coming into the city of San Antonio. We figure also under the executive pay bonuses is to be reduced or staff be reduced also, to be a fair at least. Under the planning department, uh, basically is to reduce outside consultants. Say, attorney uh, for something for the city of San Antonio, we figure why spend so much attorney fees while you got other attorneys that are still liable here in the city of San Antonio. Yeah. Under the improvements, we figure under streets is to increase the uh, the improvement on the streets, especially under drainage and streets that need uh, repairing, uh, potholes and all. And same thing, we couldn't come up with a, an actual amount because we don't figure based on uh, the streets, uh, public works, how much it would cost, uh, the manpower, the uh, material that we're gonna need. Uh, under fire and police, we feel that it should be maintained regardless 
uh, through the, out the city of San Antonio. Because of the professionalism, we need them regardless. And under the libraries, we figured to increase the uh, library fees uh, and its uh, planning, maintenance, and all that, books, uh, library vehicles, at least for the city of San Antonio and its public. Now, for park fees, we figured the same thing with what I did last time was under the holiday uh, parking, uh, say for Easter uh, or camping, is to maybe have some kind of a fee uh, adjusted to the, uh, the patrons who come to the city of San Antonio or want their tables at night uh, when the, the ban is lifted, at least uh, it's secured. You, you mean like the reservation? Fee? Reservation part, sir. Okay. Because if not, somebody will say, well, I left my chair there, and somebody says, well, there's no name, nobody. Then somebody comes along and takes it. Uh, code enforcement is basically to increase their fines. Same thing with animal care services, increase fines also, uh, basically for some revenue in between. Uh, property tax, we figure maybe a one cent uh, token to uh, the, the people of San Antonio. But I, like I said, the same thing based on uh, the appraisal itself. Since the city has not increased the, the taxes for the city of San Antonio for a while. Um, real quick, uh, where's Maria? Uh, a one cent increase would generate how much revenue? $7.4 million. All right. And we had a question on Costa toll lanes right now, but uh, right now we figure some toll lanes are either, if they go, that's going to be between city and state. So that's still up in the air. All right. And that's all we got. Okay. Thank you guys very much. <laughs> Table number is this? Seven. Seven. Let's do it. How's everybody doing? Sure, we can head to the front. Okay, so at our table, table seven, we talked about revenue and we did aligning uniform benefits with civilian employees at $15 million. So our whole table was not at a consensus of that, but the majority of the table was. Um, we had some interesting things about property tax. One would be um, aligning the, the protest rate with that of civilians, and that meaning that for these commercial high-end property, property tax owners, when they appeal their property tax and cost uh, the city in our budget and put us uh, through these uh, sessions all the time, that they could get a reduction or that they should have to sign something that says that they lose an abatement or they lose uh, some special privilege that they got if they continue to appeal their property tax over and over. As well as uh, with this property tax for, for us all going at two cents up, which would uh, equate to $15 million, right? And also with code enforcement, to get down to some of the abandoned buildings downtown where folks are just holding on to these buildings and they're not paying uh, a good rate on them because they're not doing anything with them. So they're appraised at a very low rate and therefore they're paying a very low rate in, uh, in taxes. And the one thing, I think that's something that you're pushing for too, Councilman, correct? Um, so that is all this. And that revenue would be well over 30 with this and this being at 15, everything else would be um, gravy there. So that is that. Now, things that we wanted to add. With animal care, we wanted to give Frank and John some help there at one million, right, which would um, 82 to 84% of, uh, of dog bites are by un, um, unneutered male dogs. So to get them some spay and neuter help uh, at, at animal care for one million and the raise in order to pay for that would be a 33% increase on um, uh, the fines and the, and the different fees for the alarms. When somebody has an alarm that goes off, um, that's unwarranted, right? Streets, this is a big one. I'm sure everybody's gonna be shaking their head on that, but sidewalks, uh, lights, drainage, uh, particularly around um, this district or around the 35, 37 uh, little corridor here, districts five, districts one, districts two, districts 10, is what our table uh, really looked at, especially the lights, because of, we all need, uh, you know, we all need lights, but particularly in, in, uh, in these districts to make sure that, they, that we get some help down there. Um, and they, we would pay for that with the delegate, delegate agencies, a 20% cut. Um, as Carol said, if they're nonprofits, then they need to act as a, as a nonprofit, and so let's uh, chop them down, and that would save $3.6 million, a 20% 20, 20 cut, which could make sure the streets and sidewalks and everything are safe for our most precious residents. 
um, to traverse the city, right? Uh, and for libraries, we decided to leave those, um, leave those alone, make sure there's no cuts out of the libraries. And that is table seven. All right, thank All you right. guys. I will say that, that yesterday we rolled out the, we gave ourselves and the public the first peek at our empty and abandoned buildings policy, which would apply not only to the buildings downtown, but also to abandoned homes and neighborhoods. You guys know in your neighborhoods, if you've got an abandoned home, it drags the whole neighborhood down. It could be used for all kinds of illegal activity. So we're, we're recommending and presenting what I think is the most aggressive empty and abandoned building program the city has ever seen. It is designed with both carrots and sticks to force people to do something. So downtown, we should see some movement. And to use a, a, an unpopular term, but you'll know what I'm talking about, it's designed to go after the empty buildings downtown and the crack houses in our neighborhoods. It's supposed to do both. This year is a pilot. I mean, once we do it, probably after the budget, it'll be a pilot. We'll learn from the first year how to get it right on both ends, and then we'll continue to roll it out. But it is the most aggressive one we've ever seen. Uh, there's a few articles about it in the news. We'll be talking about it again at B session not, not too far from now, but it's something we take very seriously, and you should see some movement on that very soon. Um, but thank you guys for that. Um, who's next? All right, let's do it. Who's your... All right. All right. I'll stand here with you. Okay, good. All right, thanks. Uh, basically, ours is pretty easy. No, we don't want to cut anything. We would prefer increases, everything from uh, CRT for, uh, to uh, cost of living adjustments for uh, city employees, streets and sidewalks. We we'd want to increase all of it for uh, community centers. Um, our ideas were to increase the property tax, um, to add one to two cents to the hotel tax, and to consider other revenue. He uh, suggested a lottery of some of the city property to um, divide it and um, sell it off as a lottery, which would raise a lot of more money. That, okay. Yeah. 10,000, okay, a piece of lot That's is it. valued at 10,000. So a billion tickets and make a billion dollars on it. Oh, yeah. yeah. There you go. So that takes care of the. Crowdfunded. I, I think that's brilliant. Yeah. I love it. Okay. All right. So that's right. it. That's it. We, that we just want to raise money. We don't want to cut. Okay. Thanks. All right. That's good. I, one of the other groups said something that I just want to, to, to use for food for thought very quickly. I'm not asking you to decide one way or the other. But every once in a while we'll hear about people talk about cutting economic development incentives or incentives for businesses that are coming to San Antonio. I understand why you feel that way. I don't think it's a bad argument, but I want to just play devil's advocate for one minute. You guys know for right now, the city of San Antonio is very seriously and aggressively pursuing Tesla Motors, right? Tesla Motors, for those of you who don't know, is an automaker. They make electric cars that look like Maseratis. The size of this deal, the size of the plant, think of Toyota and double it. Now, we're competing against several other cities for this opportunity. We're competing with other cities for these jobs. I can fix your street. I can fix your sidewalk. I can pick up some stray dogs. I can remove some graffiti. But if I can provide people in this town with a job that pays a very serious wage with benefits, it's up to you to decide if it's worth it. But I want you to understand the way there's another way of looking at that. And so just a thought. Right? I'm not saying to pick one way or the other, but that's the way that some folks view it. Sure. I, I'm not trying to get into a big discussion about it. I'm just pointing it out. Because, go ahead. No, I'm just uh, concerned because when Microsoft came in, we had already been developed. We had a lot of Well, on the other hand, is we're going to have brown out as a bar plant. I think uh, we couldn't have been supported. Like right. One kicks in, but then they told me they're going to close one part. Sure. So do we have the energy, do we have the water, because we really need this, a lot of water. Do we have the infrastructure, do we have the energy, do we have the The answer to all your questions is, is yes. Sure. Sure. I get it. Yes. Yes.
Sure. So, for example, the the question is, do they do they have to give anything back? And I'll what they give back are thousands of jobs. And let's say that we give. Hold, hold on, hold on. Let me talk to you about the way that the, these deals look now. Not all of them are the same, but the way they look now is if, I, if a company is going to bring 10 jobs and we offer them some sort of incentive, we say, well, you're required to give us 10 jobs for this incentive. If they only create five, let's say, we can take it all away. If they create eight, we'll say, okay, well, here's the incentive worth eight, and we'll take the remaining two back. We've now set up these incentives so that there is equity in it. We've set them up so that we have some skin in, skin in the game and they don't just take us to the cleaners. So the way the deals are set up now, they have to perform. And if they don't perform, they get some money back. I'm not advocating one way or the other. I'm just making a point about the other side of this. It's a, you're competing for jobs. Now, who's next? If they can't keep their promise, they have to give our money back. You guys ready to go? Let's do it. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. Thank you, young man who's not doing anything with the microphone. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. My man of white is over here. Thank you all for coming to this last budget hearing. Uh, each one of these has been different and interesting. We write off on our general fund to balance. We agreed that uh, we want to align everybody's health care and take a look at everybody's health care. We also want to uh, deal with management and, and freezing bonuses. We are on um, the property tax, we broke even. We had one with zero, two with two, two with one, and the other person didn't vote. So we agreed, when you look at those numbers, that we agreed that you could have a property tax increase. Now, our, we also had the abatement situation we feel like we shouldn't give anybody a 20-year abatement because it takes forever for 20 years. So we would like, if we're going to give an abatement... It takes 20 years. It takes 20 years. Yeah. Gosh, and in 20 years, a lot of these people are going to be 90. But uh, anyway, so we would like short abatements. We understand that we have to give them something. But at the same time, we don't want to give them everything. And then two years down the road, they decide to move along, and we lose that. We lose the company. A lot of times, people you lose their jobs and can't find another one at that pay rate. Anyway, um, ta -da. also, we have several other cuts that we would like to make. We would like to increase the fees at the convention center. We discussed uh, cutting the association dues to 50%, not covering all conventions, and not covering every meeting that they seem to think they need to go to. Most of us, if your job calls for going to a meeting, you wind up having to pay something on it. Uh, we also do not understand why we have the Red Berry Mansion, and you may be able to give us more information. And instead of putting more money into it, I know that it's a rental property, but perhaps we're better off selling in it, getting in the money, because it's at a good location, it's an interesting house, and maybe we could make money by selling it, rather than continue to every year have to put money into this house. Uh, and essentially, we want to keep, we want to, um, 
We want to have better streets. That's a common. And of course, we want to have libraries. And our last one is, we need to take care of our pets. So we want to maintain that. That's it. OK. Does, um, Go Spurs? Go Spurs, right. <laughs> All right. Who wants? You guys want to go next? All right. Yes. All right. So I'll start with what our plans were for cutting and for raising revenue. Our table was also concerned with abatements in conjunction with making it easier for startups or small businesses to do whatever kinds of documentation they need to do through the city of San Antonio. Uh, someone came to our table and let us know that it was cut recently, so we just said, more cuts. Uh, another one was aligning uniform benefits with civilian employees, and we were talking about the negotiations for that when it comes to their health insurance premiums, so we, we thought that might be an area of cutting. And then when we were talking about annexation, for a revenue type, that was just a possibility, but we didn't put a figure to it since we, we thought about wanting to cover services for our current boundaries. And then finally, when it came to the property taxes, uh, at the very beginning, they mentioned that one cent would, would raise some amount, and we thought that three would be okay. At the same time, everyone at our table, I think, rents our homes. <laughs> I don't think any of us own. So we said three. Chocolate, chocolate. I need this one now. Okay. Then when we were talking about our improvements, notice we have kind of an imbalanced one, but our conversation was pretty quick. Uh, one of the primary service areas came with air quality, and we thought of that based on the goal from SA 2020. Another idea we had was for a, a class that would support new parents. For example, if, if I'm having my first baby and it starts to cough, I may take it to the ER, and that would be a lot more expensive than training new parents to say, your baby has a cough. Um, another idea was with the South Side investment, and that's because Toyota is on the South Side and other, uh, other business investments that are happening on the South Side, so we should also maybe consider services for a residential promotion there. And then uh, if we did get a new employer like Tesla, then it would be really important that our job force had the skills to support a business like that. So they would not only want to come, but they would be able to stay and sustain that kind of economic growth. Uh, we also mentioned streets as being one of our priorities, things like being weather prepared for floods and freezes, and, and then transit. We put transit last. Yep, transit like roads and buses and stuff. All right, I was about to ask. All right, yeah. thank you guys. Thank you. Who's next? Thank you. thank you, young man. That was good. He's working hard. I will not stand next to you, Daryl. <laughs> no, no. Well, good evening. First off, uh, I want to apologize in advance. Table 11, even though these were some of the smartest people that I got to, to sit with and talk with. We don't follow directions very well, so I'm going to tell you right now, uh, we weren't as specific as uh, the exercise demanded. We were really, we, our conversation really suggested that uh, what was asked of us today might have been a little premature for where our minds were, meaning, you know, we think there's a different level of conversation, particularly for you, you all that are decision makers that are going to be, at the end of the day, the city council and others making these funding prioritization and, and uh, spending decisions. Be thinking about what the priorities are that we set for ourselves as a community in the first place. Uh, you can spend a lot of dollars on things, whether it's uh, a uh, $2.3 billion a year or 2.3 minus uh, what the shortfall might be. You can spend those dollars balanced to budget, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're actually going to get the return as citizens that we really want out of our community. Just spending dollars doesn't really necessarily in and of itself amount to anything. So we kind of talk thematically about focusing on our priorities as a community. What are the things that are most important to us? Just as we all do in our household, when you decide the things that are most important to you, they rise to the top and those are the things that get the attention and those are the things that get the oxygen and the resources and the things that are less important to you, still nice to have, but less important, 
those perhaps have to be deferred. So that was one thought that we had, which is really just to look at what priorities over the years we've set for ourselves as a community and focus our spending uh, in that fashion. The second thing was, uh, as a uh, addition to that is, are we being as most, most efficient as we can be with what we wind up spending at the end of the day? Is the return on the investment, does it match? Does the return match the investment? You know, whether that relates to spending on capital improvements or if you're talking about uh, salaries for uniformed or non-uniformed, uh, salaries and benefits for uniformed and non-uniformed employees who are working hard on our behalf, is the cost that you're expending actually generating a commensurate result? That's something to really be thinking about. And we don't know the answer to that now, but is the cost matching the benefit that you actually want to get out of it? We have to think about the city just like we would a business. You spend smart dollars to get smart returns. You don't just spend dollars and don't just cut indiscriminately and at the end of the year realize that nothing changed, whether you save $30 million or not. So this is a higher level conversation about setting our priorities as a community and then holding the city council and the city manager accountable for delivering returns on that. Uh, the other thing, the thematic, yeah. Well, we also have to be clear about how we measure those returns. How do we know when we've gotten it? I think that's also part of the conversation, is that I agree we have to figure out if we've gotten a return on our investment, but how do we know what it is? I, I think we all agree when we know we don't get it. Right. But figuring out what it looks like when we get it is also important. No, that's right. Well, those are, those are metrics and measurements. Once you decide what you want, you have to determine what, will, what it is that has to show up or that will satisfy you uh, that you've done those things. And that's how you can have the best conversation as citizens, frankly, with your public officials. Now I'm talking, speaking for myself. But now I think that's when you can have the best conversation with your public officials because you said, here is our budget, here are our priorities, here are the very specific things that we said as a community needed to show up and they committed that to us. Did it happen or did it not? That's a great leadership and guidance for them, for us to give to them as, as citizens versus, versus just saying, did we cut $30 million this year? But dang, life's still the same. Did we add $30 million? Life's still the same. Is education better? Are the streets better? Are, no, that's not what we're saying. We're talking about prioritization. I know, I said we didn't. I told you we didn't follow directions. I, I, I said that out front. Yeah, I, mean, there I said are, that out front. I think the, the difficult part about what you're saying, is, as much as I enjoy it, is that I would imagine that in this room, the priorities are different. That's what makes the exercise so difficult, is that there are some people who agree, to maybe even depending on where they live, right? If they live in a place where the streets are fine, it's not a priority for them. If you live in a place, let's say, closer to my house, you know, it's an issue. For some folks, it's the way we feed animals. Some people could care less about animals. That's why when, you, when we have such a diverse group of people, there has to be some way to, to marshal the conversation. It's difficult, and maybe that's where the tough choices are, right? By saying, look, we think as a city, the biggest bang for our buck, the hardest call is this, but let's see what the world looks like afterwards. But I agree that standing in place, spinning our wheels, isn't good for anybody. I would argue, however, that past four or five years, if you took a snapshot of San Antonio five years ago, and a snapshot of the city today, they're, they're different. And so I think that maybe just to add some substance to it would be to say, do we like what's happened so far? And are we moving in a direction that we need to veer away from? Uh, I know that we've had a lot of conversations about gentrification and affordable housing and, you know, the city's moving. Maybe the question is, do we like the direction it's going? Does that make sense? Because I need, as the, as the decision maker, as the person who pushes the button, I need direction. <laughs> I need to know yay or nay on something because that, that... You need directions and we're having a meeting. Wait, how? And you're going to take a picture of, of, of this and look at the city, how it's grown. Take a picture of the west side. Take a picture of... <laughs> what? We don't have those people. We don't have the meetings in there. You're ignoring some of the people. We need officers out there. We, we, we can't put more on them. We can't... We can't. I, I could not say I want to get paid like Ms. Kelly did. I can't because... She gets paid for what for, for what she who she is and what she does in her education and her degree. <coughs> Same thing with the officers. I can't say that the, the people in, in, in the city should get paid with the officers or the or the people are. They're completely different. You cannot compare them. Well, I think that. But yet, those are the, the ones you put out there. What you're saying makes a lot of sense. In that, and I agree that there are some parts of town in particular where it does seem like they're standing in place. 
where it does seem like maybe we're not making the gains we need to. It might also be that some of the other parts of town that are kind of doing okay have to agree and allow us to take some of those resources and double down on those areas. In other words, this is my own thing. I can't speak for my colleagues. Daryl, I'm sorry, to, but you led to it. It's your fault. Um, in many ways, our city policies are set up so that different parts of town get roughly the same amount of money, which is fine. But I'd also argue that there are some parts of town that have more need in terms of infrastructure or parks than others. And so we may need to, at some point, make a collective decision that we're not going to be resigned to allowing the areas you're talking about to stay where they are, that we need to double down and try to really move the needle forward. That's, but that's substantive. <coughs> anyway, sorry. I'm, uh, I, I disagree with that 100% and um, didn't mean to take us down that rabbit trail, but this is a... It's good. This is one city. I mean, we are divided up into these, um, these imaginary lines, which say District 1 and District 2 and District 3, but I don't remember the last time I was traveling outside of this city and somebody asked me where I was from and I said District 1 in San Antonio. I say San Antonio. And, you know, when we think about priority setting, which is what, you know, I was really respectfully talking about here is you spend dollars based on what's most important to you, to you as it relates to your community, that's what this exercise is about, not what's necessarily most important to you and your address. Those are important considerations, but when I think of education, I think of every single young person in this town, north, south, east, or west, and that's how you set priorities that uh, generate long-term benefits for the city and benefit everybody. Uh, so stopping there, just the last thing I'll say is we also wanted to us all to be thinking about the fact that this city is not going to get any less complex, it's not going to get smaller, it's going to get uh, larger. And again, as we look at cuts and uh, either cuts or increases in revenue, that's why priorities are so uh, important. You can't stick your hand in the, head in the sand and suggest that San Antonio's uh, going to retract. We're only gonna grow and it takes us to be smarter. <laughs> smarter in terms of what we spend, smarter in terms of what we cut, smarter in terms of what we demand uh, out of those dollars spent. Uh, to make sure that this complex city continues to be the best in the nation. So, thanks. Thank you. All right. And Daryl's right. I didn't think about the city divided to districts until I ran for one. Uh, I don't think that most people look at it that way. You're right. Uh, most people who aren't in politics look at it as a city and just say east side, west side, Jefferson area, and so forth. Who's next? Let's do it. We're next, Councilman. We had uh, not total consensus at the table, but we certainly had a, a good informational group. Uh, we started out and we did try to, to do some cuts, but we, we all know that the police department and the fire department are two of our most important departments in San Antonio. We had the fire department in my neighborhood today. So we, we realize that. So we would like for the insurance, some of them did, I didn't, to have the insurance aligned within their department. And, and uh, I, I don't know how that can be done appropriately. But anyway, that was some suggestions from our table. So. Since they've asked me to speak, I'll tell you. The uh, next thing that we would like to reduce is the city attorney's office by a million dollars. I think we've got about 40 or 50. At the attorney's turned off your mic. Oh. <laughs> oh, no. uh, uh, I knew it. Take it away from me. But anyway, uh, as San Antonio does not have insurance, we have to have attorneys to settle insurance claims every, every week, or every council meeting anyway. And it's kind of ridiculous. So we, we say, go ahead and let's take away, let's either do one or the other, let's let the city get some insurance, or take away, uh, is that a million? Oh, $4 million from the city attorneys. And there's 40 or 50 of them. I hope none of you are here tonight. <laughs> the uh, city center development, uh, 
we want to take away a million. We've got other, other things that are more important, other areas that need help, and so we want to reduce it by a million dollars. Animal care. I am a animal lover. I would feed a dog if it's on the street or give it water or do whatever. But when animals come before seniors, I've got a problem. And right now, the way the budget looks, if you look at it, you'll see that the seniors get less than the animals. And in Bear County, there's in excess of 360,000 seniors, 65 and older. So I think uh, taking a few million away there and moving it over to uh, our Department of Human Services and making sure the seniors get food or whatever that they need, whatever that they need, and many, many in San Antonio, we don't know the need. We don't even know tonight as we all sit in this room what the needs are. Somebody needs to do a survey, find out what the needs are. Uh, Oh dear, Hemisphere Park, we want to reduce it by $3 million, and I, I don't have the answers, I just know that uh, a lot has been done down there and we'd like for it to be done some other way, and I think there was a consensus on that at the table. The last thing, or last couple of things that we have, Councilman, and why I have to be the one to speak, I don't know, but we need a multi-service senior center in District 1. The Northeast is getting one that's costing us on the bond. It was the second highest thing on your bond that you voted for last time. We do not have a multi-service center, and we have many. We are the, one of the oldest districts in San Antonio. So while other people are enjoying District 7 gets a new senior center, we have a Lopez, we have a Cortez, we have all these other centers, somehow the city has left the seniors out in District 1. So we would like, and we don't know where we're going to get the money, we're going to ask for donors out there somewhere, uh, maybe McCombs and Cheevers and Below and Frost and some of the people that donate to San Antonio. We need $5 million to start for our senior center. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Ms. Eckert. <laughs> who's, who's left? All right. Let's, let's do these guys, and then I'll get over here to you guys. Okay, let's see. We didn't exactly have consensus either, so we talked a lot and we tried to do it. Um, all right, one of the thing that, things that came up is that on the one-time projects, totals about $8 million. All right, so we thought that was kind of excessive. We took a look at, look at that and that the um, the economic development that's listed on there, it's not that we don't believe that economic development needs to happen. We think there's been a redundancy of services, so we're concerned about that. For instance, SAGE, Westside Development Corporation, the City Center, and some of the things that are listed on those, those one-time hits as well, it's all around economic development, and we don't understand because the city has an economic development department that we're already paying for, so we feel like we're paying really out the nose for this, for the economic development. Um, so the one-time projects. Okay, we agree that um, the increase in sales tax, it's about time. We don't really think three cents, though. We were thinking two. Okay, because that's like a little over $2 a month. So it comes out to $28 a month on the average. Okay. I mean property. What did I say? Oh, I meant property tax. So sorry. Property tax, not sales right. tax. Okay. Um, as far as what we would add, we, we agreed with what you were talking about, that this young lady right here, that a lot of the city is really suffering as far as the streets and drainage and um, sidewalks, and so 
we think that y'all need to, to fix that. You said around St. Mary's, they need streets. There's, there's, yeah, St. Mary's University. Okay, so we think that. Um, we think that workforce development, of course, that's what I do. So we think that resources need to be increased in, work, in workforce development because there's individuals that are in this city that are on public assistance that need to come off public assistance and it will increase our tax base so they can start contributing to our economy. Yes, yes, thank you. And then we have some concerns. We think that all delegate agencies should be held to the 50% match. Nobody, but nobody should not be held to the 50% match. And then on abatements, um, we're concerned about, you were talking about, um, you know, we give these big, large abatements for all these times, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, but I don't know, this gentleman was telling me, that like Levi Strauss, when they got their abatement done, then they left. I mean, I think they went bankrupt too. And Basham Long, and I don't know, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, the, school, the school district at the time, now the laws may have changed, uh, decided to give their, their school tax. So they did, thinking that someday they would get monies back. The city did the same and others did the same. But when it came time to pay the piper, they left. There's another thing that people are not aware of, TERS and TIPS, be very careful. Other cities have gone broke because they keep creating these tax increment, what is it called? Tax uh, reinvestment increment zones, okay? So in my area, I thought, I was very happy when the subdivision moved in. It's right behind the mall on General, uh, General McMullen and uh, Commerce and that little, that, that little subdivision was built. So I was glad I said more taxes are gonna come into our area. Well, what happened is that when you have one of these TERS, the developer picks up the sales tax of the properties along Commerce. So they were collecting from Jack in the Box, McDonald's, all these groups that could have sent that sales tax directly to the school district because the school district messed up and they gave up their tax believing in it. So, these, these developers keep the taxes. And not just for the, for the area, the, the property itself in that case, but it extended beyond its lines, taking the, what do you call it? The commercial businesses along with it. So we have to be very careful that we don't get into the, the mess that other cities have gotten into. I'm concerned about those. Sure, things. fair point. And, and to the previous point about- well, Thank you. Sure, about 50% match. Um, the requirement currently is that whatever money you get from the city, you should be able to provide 50, you should be able to match it, but there are a few organizations that have a different deal, and I think that what you're asking for is equity across the board, is that right? Okay, good. You guys are in the queue. Hello, everyone. I'm Mr. Brown. Hi. Uh, we got a late start with everything, but uh, uh, there's some things that we talked about, and one of the things when we were talking about cuts and whatnot, we weren't talking about cutting employees or anything of that nature there. But one of the things we did talk about was uh, if there was going to be a, a cut one whatnot to the executive that's getting the bonuses and stuff like that, that that's one of the things that should be cut. Not only that, uh, we also talk about... Uh, a cut with the attorneys of $2 million. You know, why should you, sp uh, if you have attorneys already, why should you spend X amount of dollars hiring out attorneys to come in and pay them a bunch of money? That's what you hired them for. So they should be prepared to do whatever business it is that you hired them for. Am I right? If you hire an attorney, you expect them to do your job, right? So why should you hire another attorney outside and spend X amount of dollars so you're paying for two attorneys? So we uh, came up with a figure of, uh, $2 million on the attorney cuts. Uh, with uh, property taxes, we didn't see raising the taxes at all for homeowners, but for the commercial businesses, why not? That's not paying their fair share because they're paying less than we are, that uh, those funds and whatnot that we're not getting, which would come out to, to billions of dollars, whatnot, we need to look in changing that where we're able to get it, to get that, and that would take care of any shortfall that the city would have. 
Did you understand what I said? That would take care of any shortfall that this city would have. I understand uh, what, what the councilman was saying earlier about bringing in the business, but we have to understand that any time a business come to San Antonio, not only do they look at other, business, other areas and whatnot, but they also look at the cost of the property in those areas. And they take that on a real seriously. So if we was compared to Houston or Dallas or even Oslo or not, because of what we pay in taxes to property or not, a lot of business would come here just on that alone because they don't see they have to pay a whole lot in other areas. If they went to Dallas, they would have to pay a whole lot more. Even with the incentive that they would get, they would still be paying more than they would if they came to San Antonio. So these are some things that we looked at. We didn't look at any cuts and whatnot for the employees. Uh, we talked about the, uh, the health care, and we didn't talk about changing uh, police and fire, but we did talk about raising the civilians up to where they are at. Not getting rid of them. Why should you bring them down? That's lowering the standards when you can bring uh, civilians up. All right. All right, thank you guys. Who's left? Okay. Hi, this is table three. Uh, we looked at not uh, the words of cost. Uh, we looked at uh, savings opportunities. Um, we have first thing that came to mind was we have three police departments virtually. I know we have one chief, but we have three police departments in reality, airport, parks, and SAPD. Um, although long term, a consolidation would probably save quite a bit of money. Short term, we think with the facilities that each one uses, with the exception of the airport, particularly park police, they can use our subs. They can have their roll calls at our substation. We can close some facilities. We don't have to heat them. We don't have to air condition them. We've got substations. Uh, we balanced out the uh, manpower at each substation this last year. Uh, so we know we can absorb. There's only 100 and maybe 28 of park police. They're spread out between many uh, different shifts. They can use ours. Okay, get us a little bit closer together. Right now we do make calls. Uh, they're our brothers and uh, we support each other. But do they really need their own facility? No, I don't think so. Uh, the other was, uh, we need to investigate the privatization of all of our departments and whatever functions that can be privatized. Generally, bidding and competition brings the price down. That also gets them off the city payroll of, of uh, employees or functions. We know the city decreased over 1,300 jobs over the last five, six years. And I'm sure they did some of that. Some of this is probably ongoing in the uh, privatization. Uh, so with a million dollars savings, we think we, think we can uh, get in the, just next year if we were just closed facilities and bring them into our uh, uh, substations. And uh, maybe five million across the board if we can uh, privatize more. Um, on the revenue, the non-residential fees for those that do not live in San Antonio, they come into San Antonio to use our facilities, the zoo, the parks. Uh, let's, uh, let's raise that up uh, to where we can... Uh, raise about 200000 A 5% property tax would give us, if everybody paid 5% property tax, that would give us $35 million, wipe out the deficit. But we know we have our senior citizens and other people that need the sliding scale. Don't know how it would be structured, but I know senior citizens are already uh, considered in uh, property tax and don't pay the full amount. Uh, uh, so we think that should be investigated all the way up to $0.05. Cents. If I'm a millionaire, and I have a million dollar home, five cents, I think I can pull it, okay? But uh, if I'm a senior citizen and I'm on a fixed income, that five cents shouldn't apply to me. Um, okay, so what things we should spend a little bit more money on, uh, animal care, the spade and neuter uh, program is working. I see it work in my neighborhood and I see it work as I work the nights and I'm a police officer. Um, I see it, I see less dogs, I see less cats. Um, human services uh, with the uh, senior citizens should be increased. Streets, we all have streets and we all have that one street that you got to go by, go through to get home. And it's irritating. And you know what it feels like when it gets fixed. It's just like this 
you just, you're just happy when you turn down that road and there's no more and it's nice and black and pretty. Um, it's good. Uh, code enforcement also should be increased. Um, we had 90,000 calls last year for animals. Uh, that, uh, you know, vicious animal on my street, animal in my yard, 90,000 calls that we had to handle. And we only have a handful of code people that go out and collect these animals. And who else is responding? And we are. Uh, the police departments, the parks, uh, et cetera. Uh, where we would get this money, besides the, the property tax increase, was we need to re-examine the city managers and executive pay branch. We need to see if maybe they're not in line with the rest of everybody else's pay increases and slow that down or look at their bonuses. Uh, one-time projects, we have a lot of one-time projects in this city that fail, okay? I don't know if you're all aware of it. Every once in a while it makes it in the newspaper. We don't vet them out very well. Maybe if we squeeze down that budget, we'd be a little bit better on examining what we're doing with those one-time projects. So we would decrease those. Uh, I think we decreased those by 2.5 million, and uh, it paid for these things, or 3.5 million. And that's what we would do at table three. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys very much. All right, who haven't we heard from? Back here. All right, with a sense of urgency, here we go. Uh, we would like to go the extra cent on property tax, uh, not one cent, but two cent, creating four plus 10 equals 14 uh, million. Also in, okay, um, we, we spend most of our time actually just trying to analyze um, the budgets, a whole lot of information, but in terms of um, cutting, I think we looked at uh, delegate agencies and for that we would take down uh, one million. And then um, offering a uh, student perspective, I recently attended the uh, Urban Affairs Association Conference on behalf of the UTSA College of Public Policy. And uh, some trends in urban planning that we saw were not just growth for growth's sake, uh, but smart growth as uh, economist Donovan Murkema uh, calls it right sizing. And so uh, we would like to add um, here historic preservation. And actually what Diego talked about in uh, revitalizing the, um, the Central Business District is based on a report titled Moving the Market by uh, San native San Antonian and recent Harvard graduate, uh, Reagan Turner, in which case he actually goes through, uh, aside from a number of issues, uh, he makes the economic case for historic preservation. Um, for example, historic preservation creates more jobs than the same amount of new construction. Um, and also the costs are less uh, because the building's already there. You don't have to sort of create it from scratch. Um, also, historic preservation is an ideal economic development strategy for small business development um, and retention. Um, another thing, uh, the uh, King William District, I believe in District 1, um, it was one of the first uh, historic preservation efforts in Texas. And when people move back to a city, like let's say they went away to college and, and they want to move back to San Antonio, the historic districts are some of the first um, places they look. Um, also. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the appreciation values of historic buildings often outperform the market as a whole. Um, so that's a big one as well. And then we also, uh, that, that is revenue neutral um, in, in terms of uh, having to take and, uh, and give because a lot of the structures are already pre-existing and so we can just kind of keep on doing what we're doing and focus on that specifically. So thank you. All right, very good. Who have we missed? All right. I, just, just for, the, this isn't planned, just for the exercise, just want a few of you. I, I'd like to know, regardless of what you think my feelings are, does anyone want to call out a couple of trends, things that they've seen that are common to a lot of the tables? Is there anything that you see consensus on? Streets? Animals? All right, countdown. Property taxes, property tax increase. I mean, I th I'm, I'm just trying to make sure that we walk away with at least two or three things that we've taken away from, priorities that um, we've heard throughout. So I, I don't want to speak for you guys. I'm hearing streets, not that I'm discounting the others, but just to get the top three or four. Streets, 
taxes of some a tax increase of some sort abatements maybe abatements animals I'm asking for a consensus, not what you, I'm asking, I'm not asking, so let's, let me ask a different way. Put your own feelings aside for a second and think about what you've heard the other tables say, not your table, the other tables. Streets, taxes, <laughs> less lawyers, I want to disappear in the thin air. Okay, I mean, at, at least for the discussion tonight, not that the other things weren't as important, but I hear you guys saying you heard from the other tables at the very least, tell me when I'm wrong, streets, some sort of tax increase, and something about lawyers. Is that, is that right? Look, looking at salaries, salary disparities, okay. All right, that's important for us just because, again, it's not as if the other things you've said aren't important, but part of this is to figure out if there's some big three or four priorities that we walk away from, and I appreciate that very much. Um, I'm going to close it out by thanking you guys for coming. All right. I um I wouldn't even know how to start to do that, but it's a good idea. It is. I do think nerd alert real quick, I do think the new Google Maps app color codes your route to let you know if there's something happening. So when it's red, it's really slow, and you can ask it to find you another route. I think the update to Google Maps does that. Look, you guys, thank you so much for coming. Uh, you've been really great and patient. You put up with me. Uh, but thank you so much for your time tonight. It means a great deal to us.